This is Ham College, Episode 81, for September 30th, 2021. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. ICOM has the perfect base station ready for action. Hi, welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we have a show tonight all about different types of noise and noise reduction. So, be some interesting topics tonight. Do you know what's been going on? Oh, not too much. Just uh, been enjoying this nice weather. Um, working on a couple projects around the house here for some amateur logic segments. What did we talk about in the last show? Do you remember? You know, that's a good question because I printed out the sheet and it's over there across the room in the printer. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the topics, honestly. Let me see. Was it uh, possibly receiver performance characteristics? Yep. That sounds like that could have been it. Maybe blocking dynamic range, intermodulation, and cross-modulation interference, third-order intercept, Desensitization uh, and pre-selectors. Exactly. Could have been pretty close to that. Yeah. So what yeah. are we going to talk about this time around? Well, I do have that one. We're going to be talking about noise suppression and interference, system noise, electrical appliance noise, line noise, locating noise sources, DSP noise reduction, noise blankers, ground in for signals, and common mode currents. That's a lot to cover in one hour. That is a pretty good bit. Yeah. But we can do it. I think we can. I think we'll... Uh, maybe a buzzer or two, but it won't be buzzing all night long, I don't believe. Well, I hope not. Yeah. We'll see. Well, there's one you other... You just never really can tell about these things. <laughs> well, true. One other <laughs> thing we always like to mention at the first of the shows, especially on Ham College... And that is, we've got a chat room going on anytime we're live. Uh, you can catch us in the chat room, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. But what that's going to tell you if you go there is we're using the YouTube chat. So if you're watching the live stream, you're watching it on YouTube, on the Amateur Logic channel, the chat right there is the one that we're using these days. You have to be a subscriber to the Amateur Logic TV YouTube channel uh, to to post in the chat. Now, you can watch it without subscribing, but if you'd like yeah. to post in there, uh, go subscribe. We do that to keep the spam and stuff out of it, and uh, that yeah. has really helped. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we, we couldn't really use that. Yeah, so. otherwise you're going to have to watch screen door ads and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's uh, we, we literally watch it during the show, so... Join in with us, and uh, it's a good time in there. Are you ready to get on into it? Let's do the coin toss. Um, Call it. Virtual coin toss? Yep. I, I elect to receive. Okay. I think we can arrange that. So first question for tonight, what problem can occur when using an automatic notch filter, ANF, to remove interfering carriers while receiving CW signals. A, removal of the CW signal as well as the interfering carrier. B, any nearby signal passing through the DSP system will overwhelm the desired signal. C, received CW signals will appear to be modulated at the DSP clock frequency. Or D, ringing in the DSP filter will completely remove the spaces between the CW characters. You know, I'm a big CW guy, but yeah. not really. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what you... problem can occur when using an automatic notch filter? 
to remove interfering carriers while receiving CW. Removal of the CW signal as well as the interfering carrier in your bus signal passing through the DSP system will overwhelm desired signal. Receive CW will appear to be modulated at the DSP clock frequency. Green in the DSP filter will completely remove the space between the CW characters. It's not going to be D. Notch filter to remove interfering carriers. It's, so, it's awful narrow. CW is so narrow. I think it's going to probably be A is going to be the most plausible one. Removal of the CW signal as well as the interfering carrier. Everyone in the chat room is saying A. So, uh, yeah, if you've ever tuned in a CW signal on your HF rig while the notch filter is on, you know that's immediately what it does. You just hear it take out that CW signal. Now, you got a question for me? Sure do. It's right here. How about this one? That'll work. Which of the following types of noise can often be reduced with a digital signal processing noise filter? A, broadband white noise. B, ignition noise. C, power line noise. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Which of the following types of noise can often be reduced with a digital signal processing noise filter? Broadband white noise, that's going to be like like hiss or like if you tuned in on an FM receiver between channels, all frequency, you're going to hear broadband noise there. Just, you know, constant hissing. Ignition noise, that's going to be like spark plug noise and stuff. It's going to be the little spikes. Power line noise. Probably buzzing and static, but a DSP filter, it's going to help some on all of those. So I'm going to say it's D. All of these choices are correct. <clears throat> Chat rooms. Yeah. yeah, that's what they're saying. And it is. And I'm going to say on these questions tonight, if you've used a modern receiver, on HF, you, you'll probably know a lot of these from personal experience. So let's go on to the next one here, Dean. Which of the following signals might a receiver noise blanker be able to remove from a desired signal? A, signals that are constant at all IF levels. Signals that appear across wide bandwidth. C, Signals that appear at one IF, but not another. D, signals that have a sharply peaked frequency distribution. Hmm. Which of the following signals might a receiver noise blanker? Noise blanker. I think that's a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad filter type. A, signals that are constant at all IF levels, signals that appear across a wide bandwidth, I think it's going to be B. Signals that appear at 1 IF, that's not going to be, it's not going to be C. I don't think it's going to, I'm not sure what sharply peaked frequency distribution means. I think the noise blanker, that's a pretty broad, a pretty broad filter. I think it's going to probably be B on that one. I'll, I'll agree with you. It's going to be B. Yeah, I know that's a pretty wide, pretty broad filter. And the question is a little bit tricky there. Um, a noise blanker doesn't... It, it doesn't really um, blank out a wide bandwidth that you would think that answer was was kind of saying, but the types of noise that a noise blanker is effective on are usually on a lot of frequencies. 
So yeah, spark plug noise. Yeah, the signal's going to appear across a wide bandwidth. Although the signal itself, I don't know that you'd call it wide bandwidth because it's just a bunch of little spikes out there, and the noise blinker just more or less cuts off the receiver during those little uh, pulses or spikes that you're receiving. I, believe yeah, I know I had to run it a lot in my uh, when my 857D was in my other truck. Uh, pretty much had to stay on when I was on HF. Well, I do right now in... Um, in my Explorer, for some reason, I've got bad impulse noise, spark plug noise with it. And I need to get in there and work on it, ground the hood better, although I think I've already done that. Try to figure out what that is. Because if you can get away without running a real high noise blanker level, you're better off. If you've got mm -hmm. your noise blanker cranked up real high and a strong signal comes on nearby, it's, it's going to kind of yeah. wreak havoc. Sounds pretty nasty, doesn't it? Oh, if yeah, if it sounds at all, it uh -huh. you know a lot of times it'll just cut out everything else. It is pretty magic. Ed in the chat room said there, it's I'm agreeing. It is magic. Yeah, and Mike says it's effective only on pulse type of noise, and that and that's correct. Generally, that's going to be like uh, spark plug or ignition noise, but there's other. Mm -hmm sources of uh, spiky type of noise as well. Okay, next question. How can conducted and radiated noise caused by an automobile alternator be suppressed? A, by installing filter capacitors in series with the DC power lead and a blocking capacitor in the field lead. B, by installing a noise suppression resistor and a blocking capacitor in both leads. C, by installing a high-pass filter in series with the radio's power lead and a low-pass filter in parallel with the field lead. Or D, by connecting the radio's power lead directly to the battery and by installing coaxial capacitors in line with the alternator leads. Okay, this one's a little tricky. Um, yeah, I'm glad you got this one. How can conducted and radiated noise caused by an automobile alternator be suppressed? And that's usually a whining type of noise. So, and it changes with your engine speed, of course, because your alternator's speeding up, slowing down. A, by installing filter capacitors in series with the DC power lead. And a blocking capacitor in the fill lead? No. Because capacitors do not pass DC. They'll only pass AC signals. So if you put a capacitor in series with your DC line, you're not going to get any battery voltage to your radio. So no, it can't be that. B, by installing noise suppression resistors and a blocking capacitor in both leads. Um, resistors are used sometimes in spark plug leads, so that's the reason you might be tricked into thinking a noise suppression resistor could be used for this. But no, you wouldn't put resistors in your power lead. That's it's not good. Um, <laughs> and a blocking capacitor. No, a blocking capacitor generally means that you're blocking DC from getting through one side to the other. We don't want to block the DC. We need DC to run our radio. So it's definitely not B. C, by installing a high-pass filter in series with the radio's power lead and a low-pass filter in parallel with the fill lead. Hmm. This one doesn't make sense either by installing a high-pass filter in series with the power lead. Why would you want to do that? Uh, you know, a high-pass filter means that it's going to pass higher frequencies and not lower frequencies. Well, DC is like zero hertz. Why <laughs> would you want to block it, you know? I mean, you've you got to have your DC going through there. There would be no advantage to blocking low frequencies 
on the line because usually it's going to be uh, higher frequencies that the alternator wind is coming from. So it's not that. So I'm going with D by process elimination. By connecting the radio's power lead directly to the battery and by installing coaxial capacitors in line with the alternator leads. And coaxial capacitors are actually sort of like bypass capacitors. In other words, it's not like you're putting a capacitor itself in series with that lead. It's like your your lead goes through and there's a capacitor around it going to ground so it's bypassing the signal that that might be noise dc capacitor is not going to affect but any ac which uh interference or noise alternator wind is going to be some type of ac so by having a capacitor there or coaxial capacitor there you're essentially bypassing that noise to ground. So that's going to be my answer. I'm I'm saying it's D. What do you think, Dean? Uh, yeah. Sounds sounds like a good one. <laughs> yeah, everybody yeah. in the chat. I, I really I really wasn't sure on this one. The D sounds plausible. Yeah. Everybody said D in the chat room, so that is it. Some of those terms are may sound familiar, but yeah, but they're not used for these purposes. Yeah. Trying to be sneaky. Exactly. And you know they will do that on these exams. Mm-hmm. So, how can radio frequency interference from an AC motor be suppressed? A, by installing a high-pass filter in series with the motor's power lead. B, by installing a brute force AC line filter in series with the motor leads. C, by installing a bypass capacitor in series with the motor leads. D, by using a ground fault current interrupter in the circuit used to power the motor. Well, D's not going to be it. That's a safety mechanism. I don't see why that would help. Huh? Yeah. Uh, let's see, by installing a bypass capacitor in series with the motor leads, AC motor. I'm gonna go with the I'm gonna go with the plain obvious one right here by installing a brute force AC line filter. Most everyone in the chat room is agreeing with you. It's B. I am too. That's what it is. Yeah, some of these are like impossible. Like C, you cannot install a bypass capacitor in series with a motor lead. A bypass capacitor runs from the lead to ground. If you put a capacitor in series, it wouldn't really be bypass. So. Oh, true. Yeah. And growl fault interrupter you know that's the socket in your bathroom you know, yeah that's the safety that's the safety mechanism yeah i hope you're not going to stand in the water and yeah work on your motor well i hope you don't have a ground rod attached to your car good yeah. point if you if you do you're not going very far <laughs> no not in a hurry <laughs> definitely not all right let's move on to the next one interesting what is the one type of electrical interference that might be caused by a nearby personal computer? A, a loud AC hum in the audio output of your station receiver. B, a clicking noise at intervals of a few seconds. C, the appearance of an unstable modulated or unmodulated signal at specified frequencies. Or D, a whining type of noise that continually pulses on and off. That B clicking noise, that's your Western Digital hard drive. <laughs> they used to sound like that, but I don't... Yeah. I, I think that was aural interference, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What type of noise be caused by a nearby personal computer? Well, it's not a loud AC hum. By AC hum, I assume they're talking about a 60-cycle hum. 
Mm -hmm. A nearby computer wouldn't do that. A clicking noise at intervals of a few seconds. Well, your computer power supply is not turning on and off every few seconds, or really you wouldn't be able to do much work on your computer. Uh, so, no, it doesn't generate that kind of noise. Uh, D, a whining type noise that is continually pulsing on and off. No, because if it's continually turning on and off and you can hear that, your power supply must be something wrong with it. It's not going to be producing very good DC power to to run your computer. So I'm going to have to say it's C, the appearance of unstable modulated or unmodulated signals at specific frequencies. I would agree with that 110%. Uh, and the chat room does too. And I believe it is, like you say, 110%. So. Yeah, there we go. I think we've all probably seen that one. Yeah. That is the first group of questions here. So what do you say we take a quick break? Okay. Come right back. Use a break. ICOM has the base station of your dreams with the IC7851, IC7610, IC9700, and IC7300 STR transceivers. ICOM's amateur radios are top of the line and are the first choice for contesters across the globe. Robust base stations like these cut through pileups letting you work the bands and record those contacts. Stay connected remotely with the RSBA1 app and keep your competitive contesting edge with ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. The IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world and is HF excellence unparalleled. With faster processors, high input gain, high display resolution, and a cleaner signal, it's truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. Dual receivers, digital IF filters, memory keyer, digital voice recorder, high-resolution spectrum waterfall display, enhanced PC connectivity, and SD memory card slot. The ICOM IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants. This high-performance SDR can pick out the faintest of signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling System, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy, faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. 4.3-inch color touchscreen display, real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex operation in satellite mode. The ICOM IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. This high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF Direct Sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. What do you say we give away something? Hey, how about, I got these over here. How about a cap and an ICOM shirt? Got a nice ball cap. Nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt. The same thing on the front and the back. So you look just as good when you're leaving the ham fest as you did when you got there, as we all usually say. Okay, I always say. But uh, how about something like that? I think that would work, and whatever else Jesse could stuff in the box, that that would be good, too. So if you wanted to win that, well, you could send us an email to this address right here, 
Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv, and we will register you in next month's drawing. All you got to have is a, a name and an email address. Pretty much everybody's got those. Yeah. And just just send us a, an email, and we'll enter you in the contest. If you want to drop a little message in there, well, that's good, too. And as a matter of fact, this month's winner was drawn just before the show tonight. And he did have a, a little message for us here. He said, hi, guys. Love your shows. I'm in for the ICOM swag. Thanks, Bob. 7-3 from W2RWM. Well, congratulations, Bob. You're this month's winner of the Amateur Logic Ham College ICOM swag package. So... Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. If if you if you entered and you did not win this month, if you weren't Bob and you want to enter, you're going to need to enter again for the following month because the the undrawn ones don't carry over. The queue got emptied out when the drawing was made, uh, so we start off clean each month. So be sure and send your entry in for next month's drawing. Yeah, and we we don't harvest the emails on this or any of the contests that we do no. on Ham College or Amateur Logic. Once the contest is ended, um, we wipe them out. So please go enter again. Which of the following can cause shielded cables to radiate or receive interference? A, a low inductance ground connection at both ends of a shield. B, common mode currents on the shield and conductors. C, use of braided shielding material. D, trying all ground connections, I'm sorry, D, tying all ground connections to a common point, resulting in differential mode currents in the shield. Hmm. Which of the following can cause cables to radiate or receive interference? I know common mode currents can cause problem. Tying the ground conditions to a common point built in differential mode currents on the shield. If it helps you out any, there are not many folks answering this one in the chat room. Yeah, I don't blame them. I'm trying not to look at it. I think it's going to be B because I don't really like the way that D is worded. I'm going to agree with you and everyone in the chat room does. It is B. It's common mode currents that get on the shield and cause problems back inside the shack. What current flows equally on all conductors of an unshielded multi-conductor cable? A, differential mode current. B, common mode current. C, reactive current only. Or D, return current. What current flows equally on all conductors of an unshielded multi-conductor cable? D, return current. I'm not sure what that is. C, reactive current only. I'm not sure I know what reactive current is. A, differential mode current. I'm not really sure what that is either. They, they're they not saying if anything's connected differentially in there. Uh, B, common mode current. That's going to be my answer there. Uh, yeah, I don't know what differential mode current is. That was one of the options on the previous questions. Yeah. Previous answers, rather. Well, I don't think that's it. I'm going to go with B, common mode current chat room. Uh, well, it's kind of got to be seen in light of the previous question. Yeah. Chat room, yeah, they're saying B. And it is. I know you've been wanting some buzzer here. I don't know if this will produce it, but let me give it my best shot. Well, I don't want the buzzer on me. Oh, okay. What undesirable effect can occur when using an IF noise planker? Ooh. A, received audio in the speech range might have an echo effect. B, the audio frequency bandwidth of the received signal might be compressed. 
C. Nearby signals may appear to be excessively wide even if they meet emission standards. Or D. FM signals can no longer be demodulated. Okay, I, I don't think I don't think it's going to be D. Received audio in the speed trains might have an echo effect. I, I've never heard a, a noise blanker have an echo effect, so I'm going to say it's not A either. The audio frequency bandwidth of the received signal might be compressed, which I'm thinking will make it sound sort of tinny and thin. Or C, nearby signals may appear to be excessively wide. I, I'm going to go with B, but I, I'm not sure. I, I almost want to say that it's C, but I don't know why it would seem like the uh, the nearby signals are are, are wider than they, they are. Okay. I don't know. Hopefully, maybe you got some explaining to do. I do. Apparently. Um, Should have went with the hunch. You've been wanting that buzzer tonight, and I'm I'm happy. Yeah, to. but I don't want it on me. I just like it when you have the buzzer. <laughs> well, let me say, most everybody in the chat room got the buzzer on this one. There were a couple of guys, a uh, couple of well, maybe three different folks had the right answer in there. That's a pretty tough one right there. Majority of them had the wrong answer. You want me to do some splaining? Please. All right. We kind of touched on it a little earlier when we talked about yep. the noise blanker. And mm -hmm. and you kind of touched on it right there. But it's the wording on this that's throwing everything out. I'll agree with you. It can't be A. I mean, I've never heard of a echo effect mm. in a speech range. But I never heard an echo effect from a noise blanker. And definitely it's not D. FM signals can no longer be demodulated. Um, the audio frequency bandwidth of the received signal might be compressed. That means it's just kind of like being narrowing up the bandwidth of the received signal. And a noise blanker doesn't do that. I mean, that would just be like... Um, well, just narrowing up the bandwidth of, of your audio receive signal. Some, well, you can't do that with a noise blanker. Some DSP filters do that, but not they're not a noise blanker. So it's going to be C. Nearby signals may appear to be excessively wide, even if they meet emission standards. And the reason I say that is earlier we mentioned that when you turn on the noise blanker and someone else on the band comes on with a real strong signal that it'll just destroy what you're trying to receive blank it out completely and you would think oh uh, yeah that does appear that the uh, the other station the one that's interfering with you maybe is excessively wide when actually it's not it's your noise blanker is giving you that impression or or mm -hmm. that result so it's kind of trick wording there. Nearby signals may appear to be excessively wide, even if they meet emission standards. Well, it fell right into the trap. Well, you did, and they're good at these traps, man. They caught a bunch of folks on that one right there. Um, well, at least I was in good company. Yeah. Yep, you all went down together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, some, some people got it right, but it, you know. Kind of tricky wording on that one. Well, we won't hold that against those people. Oh, no. What might be the cause of a loud roaring or buzzing AC line interference that comes and goes at intervals? A, arcing contacts in a thermostatically controlled device. B, a defective doorbell or doorbell transformer inside a nearby residence. C, a malfunctioning illuminated advertising display. Or D, all these choices are correct. What might be the cause of a loud roaring or buzzing AC line interference that comes and goes at intervals? Uh, arcing contacts in a thermostatically controlled device. Possibly. B, a defective doorbell or doorbell transformer inside a nearby residence. I've heard of that 
be an uh-huh. issue before. C, a malfunctioning illuminated advertising display, or maybe like you'd say a sign. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've I've heard that before, so I know at least two of those will cause that in the arcing contacts in a thermostatically controlled device. That yeah, that could I could see that causing it too. So I'm gonna go with D. All of these choices are correct. Yeah, that seems right to me. Yeah. D. Looks like that's what the ones in the chat room brave enough to answer are saying. So let's see. <laughs> yeah. All these choices. Yeah, you could see all of those. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. I yeah, so, I could I could understand how that could happen to any of those. Well, I appreciate the easy question on that. Well, you know, I'm just trying to trying to keep things moving along here, man. Well keep entertainment value up. Let me see if I can give you an easy one. If I can't, it'll be a hard one. What could cause no. local AM broadcast band signals to combine to generate spurious signals in the MF or HF bands? A, one or more of the broadcast stations is transmitting an overmodulated signal. B, nearby corroded metal joints are mixing and re-radiating the broadcast signals. C, you are receiving skywave signals from a distant station. D, your station receiver IF amplifier stage is defective. We could cause local and broadcast band signals to combine and generate spurious signals, MF and HF. Uh, it's, not, it's not D. And it's not C because we're talking about local AM broadcast bands not receiving Skyway from a distant station. Okay, so it's good. I'm down to A or B. One or more of the broadcast stations is transmitting an overmodulated signal. Overmodulated. Amplitude modulation. B, nearby corroded metal joints are mixing and re-radiating the broadcast signals. One or more broadcasters. I don't think it's either A or B. I'm pretty sure of that. And I don't think it's A. One or more of the broadcast stations is transmitting an overmodulated signal. That's amplitude modulation. Let me say this one's a little tricky in some of those answers, too. Well, I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not C or D. I'd almost bet on that. Almost. One or more of the broadcast stations is transmitting an overmodulated signal. So they're going to mix and cause a spur. I know that AM, if AM, if it's if it's close by, that stuff gets into everything, man. I, I, I'm gonna go with B, just because I don't think A is right, but I don't know why B's right either. I could see that A, the AM getting into stuff. It used to get into everything when we lived over near uh, off of Beasley Road. I used to live in an apartment right there, right right by the antennas, and. Uh, I'm just going. I'm guessing B. I, I don't think it's A. It, pro- it probably is because I said B. But at any rate, that's my guess. That's um, that's what I'm sure it's not C or D. I know that. They're saying. At least I think the I know it. Chat room. Most everybody is saying B in there. Okay. Um, I'm saying it's B too. And it is. And would you like some explaining on this one? Absolutely. All right. The reason A is not right, because 
the the question again is saying AM broadcast band signals to combine and generate spurious signals. Yeah. Uh, if and that's and that's kind of why I ruled out A. One or more of the broadcast stations is transmitting an overmodulated signal. Yeah, if one of the broadcast stations was generate or transmitting an overmodulated signal, it might cause some spurs. It wouldn't take a second station out there to combine with it to do that. That one by itself could possibly generate some spurs. Whether there's another signal there or not really wouldn't have any effect on that. And mm. C and D, yeah, uh, you knock those out right away because it's nothing to do with sky wave signals. Yeah, those yeah. two didn't even really make any yeah. sense to me. And it's nothing to do with the receiver IF amplifier stage is defective. Um, but B, nearby corroded metal joints are mixing and re-radiating the broadcast signal. When you've got a corroded joint, and that can be like, uh, like a, some connection on a tower might be a corroded joint there or a chain link fence nearby you know might might uh, have a couple of wires crossing there's a little corrosion right there that causes a nonlinear um, rectification of the signal uh, when you've got a, a corroded metal joint this comes up quite often when you're reading about uh, intermodulation interference and a corroded metal joint will will definitely cause that. Where otherwise, those two signals might not be any problem at all. And there's other things hmm. that can cause, you know, combining and, and generate spurious signals. But the only one listed out of these four here that really could is B. Corroded metal joint. Okay. Interesting question. Now that's all the questions for tonight. There is one I wanted to revisit here, if I can remember which one it was now. Back in the question that we had, how can conducted and radiated noise caused by an automobile alternator be suppressed? And we had those mm -hmm. answers there, and they were all talking about capacitors. The coaxial capacitor? Co yeah, all of that stuff. And mm hmm there is another way that you can block alternator noise, and I'm surprised it wasn't on here. I don't know why they didn't have it on there, because I've done it before. And you used to could buy these. Radio Shack even sold them for uh, CB radios. It's a coil. You put a coil in series on the, uh, on the DC line, and that can block alternator noise. And huh. somewhere here, I've, I don't know if you remember it, I took that, uh, that metal ring and wrapped a bunch of turns of wire around it mm -hmm. and a capacitor because I had such bad noise in that expedition that I had. And that, that's right. the only thing that finally cured it. I tried everything else, and that knocked it right out. That's not one of your choices, so maybe I shouldn't have said anything about that. But I did, so it's, Yeah, so don't let it confuse you. Yeah. Just know it later when you have the problem. Yeah, just the fact that it worked for me doesn't mean you'll pass the exam with it because it's not one of the answers you can choose. Okay. Why don't we get a quick message here? And then you can sing the theme song, and we'll talk about how we're going to give away this radio. All right. Around the 15th of each month, it's Amateur Radio's original and longest-running video podcast, AmateurLogic.tv, with hosts George Thomas, Tommy Martin, Emil Diodene, and Mike Morneau. Roughly, here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. We're in the antenna switching matrix, 
Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas. I personally am so thrilled that George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. What about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier and oh, I lost power in the shack and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. And we can take this and put it over inside our box. It's flush to the bottom. If we were to rotate, we can see that thing goes all the way through. So we'll have a hole in the bottom. What ammunition do you use in there? Uh, actually, you can use black powder. You can use um, <laughs> WD-40. You can use, you know, anything combustible. Um, you just have to use the right quantity. And uh, we assume no responsibility for mishaps. <laughs> Here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and the heat shrinked up. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. I have two thin film solar cells to run this. Looks like a little mini weather satellite, actually. And uh, I'm using a guitar string for the antennas. I particularly like that last one there, $29.99. You can get a 50-foot garden hose extension cord combo. <laughs> <laughs> Do not get cord wet. Now, most of these J-poles are built with metal elements or tubing. Uh, the reason I chose wire for this one is the length of this particular one. So I wanted to hang it from the tree so I can hoist it up there. Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. Yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. We're going to be giving away Tommy's QRP ham station. Pretty much. Pretty much. I think I've got pretty much. Actually, I do have all that stuff. Yeah, you do. You do. So For two more weeks. Yeah, it's not long. You need to enter now. Let's talk about what it is first. It's the ICOM IC705. You've heard us talk about it before. I wish I had one of these. Tommy does have one. I do have one. I just happen to have it right here handy, too. And I actually unzipped the zippers this time oh, before you did. the show. You need to spin the dial on yours, too. I need to turn mine on. I can see. Yep. I got to say, I, I am very impressed with this, and I'm not just saying it. It's because I really am, I would not have thought you could have a QRP rig that had so much built into it. And this is essentially just like a IC7300, which is much larger, except this one has VHF and UHF and D-Star in it as well as HF. The battery. It's pretty awesome. I, I love mine. Yeah. Fantastic. And you've got it in the backpack, which we'll be giving away yep, as well. So yeah, the backpack's pretty nice. It's got uh, well, I didn't unzip all of it. I don't want to run the zipper noise some to air here, but so let's talk a little bit about the radio. So I see seven oh five all mode portable. It's an all mode radio covers HF, 50 megahertz, 144 megahertz, and 430 megahertz. It's got D-Star DV built in, single sideband, CW, AM, and FM modes. And you can even enjoy FM broadcast and airband reception on that radio as well. RF direct sampling system. It greatly reduces distortion, a high-speed, high-resolution, real-time spectrum scope, and waterfowl display are incorporated in the compact design for the first time in a radio of this class. Real-time spectrum scope and waterfowl display, just like in the IC7300 and IC9700, uh, now you can have it for field operation. Utilize base station features without the price of one, in a compact radio, quickly monitor band activity and find a clear frequency, which can be important. GPS functions are built in, 
enhanced field operations with the built-in GPS functions and the antenna as well. Functions include location logging, RXTX locations via DPRS, near me repeater scan search, QSO recording with metadata, and internal clock synchronization. It's a large 4.3 inch color touch screen to improve visibility and operability in the field. Built in Bluetooth, wireless LAN. You can use it with a smartphone linking and remote control. It's got a micro SD card slot to store user profiles, QSO recording, a transmit voice memory key, ready logging, GPS data, and screen captures. And it comes with the supplied HM243 speaker mic, which is a, a really nice, heavy little speaker microphone here as well. And you can uh, assign keys on it as well for frequently used functions. Operates uh, from, well, actually a handy talkie battery. This is the same battery that you'll find on many ICOM handy talkies, uh, particularly the uh, ID51 series. It's a little lithium ion battery. You could have several of these charged up and ready to go if you were going to go out and operate for a while in the field. Very white, lightweight little battery. And you could take the one off your handy talkie if you've got that with you as well. With that battery, you can get 5 watts, or you can use an external 13.8 volt DC supply with the power jack here on the side. It comes with the cable as well. And if you use an external power, like uh, maybe a 12 volt battery or a power supply, you can get 10 watts out of that rig. Mm -hmm. It's a direct sampling receiver, and it receives on frequencies between 0.03 megahertz and 470 megahertz. Really nice radio. Tommy doesn't want to give it away. Doesn't want to give his away. But uh, we're going to give this one away. Got some things to go with it as well. Tommy, when you go out in the field and you want to tune that thing, you know, if your antenna is is resonant, that's best. But what if your antenna is not resonant? You might want to. And and it's it's probably not. It's... uh, well, not for every band, but what would you use? Well, the AH705 tuner. I've actually got one of those in that bag as well. That tuner covers from uh, 1.8 megahertz up to 50 megahertz bands. There's an SO239 connector for 50 ohm antenna, such as a dipole or Yagi on it. There's a terminal connector or a binding post that you can use for a random or long wire antenna. Uh, uses two different power sources. It uh, works off of AA batteries or 13.8 point volts DC. It's IP54 dust protection and water resistance uh, rated. Full automatic tuning. Just push the tuner button on the 705, and uh, I've got a segment or a short on that. Uh, you can go back and review that later if you want to. And it's got latching relays for saving power consumption. So once it's tuned, it's going to stay that way if, even if you take the batteries out. Yep. So. It's, uh, it's really awesome. I, I love mine. Yeah. So. And I actually... I don't know how many times I can say that. A lot, apparently, because it's really it's true. Well, yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't love it. It's, it's really well constructed. I've done... Uh, uh, well, an amateur logic short on this where I actually opened it up, called it unboxing the IC705. Yeah, when Ray wasn't looking. Yeah, it was Ray's. I took it apart, looked inside. Very, very well built. Some good ideas went into how they assemble this yeah. thing and how rugged yeah, it is. Yeah, that's, that's the reason why I had left mine over there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't leave your radio either. I haven't opened this one. Let me just say these are, are <laughs> still have the fract. Yeah, that, that was the seal. one that had been open went back with Ray. Yeah. Uh, also, you're going to win the optional LC192 backpack. It's the ultimate must-have accessory. It's got a pouch for holding your radio right in the top. The radio actually on the bottom of it 
has a uh, a threaded mount right there. Yep. So the radio is actually bolted into that backpack. Yeah, there's a quarter twenty screw that goes through a little flap back there that keeps it from falling out. If yeah. you if I pull on it, it'll just it'll just tilt forward, but it won't come out. Yeah, it's hooked so it's to secured a in there. Safety strap. There's internal panels as well for custom compartments for accessories such as antennas, battery packs, and more things that you might want for an afternoon of soda activation. Now, you've got a lot of accessories in there right now. Yeah, I've got a rubber duck antenna in case I want to get on D-Star. Um, got some connectors, uh, the power cord if I want to hook it up to my external battery. Um, working on a, building a wire antenna for it. Uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, anyway, so whoever wins this one's going to get an antenna already together. They'll hear about it shortly. But uh, got got more room in here, so that's what I'm planning on putting in it. And then my my portable battery will go in here as well. But it's a lot, a good bit of room. It's a kind of a small, oops, kind of a small backpack uh size wise but it's the way it's designed is pretty efficient you can pack a lot of stuff in here oh yeah and there's there's stuff that you know we've never mentioned before on the side of it here there's actually some holders here where you could take a whip antenna and just stick down through the backpack there and carry it with yeah. you as well it goes right through here wow yeah you can't really see it because it's black but yeah. Well, trust me, it's there. It's there. <laughs> but uh, I, I do that sometime with the, uh, the rubber duck whip that I've got right here. Yeah. It goes, goes through there and attaches to the side of the radio. Now, you could do that with your bigger antenna as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, we've got some other things to go with this. Like, uh, maybe you'd you'd want an external power supply if you want to operate this at home you probably wouldn't want to run it on the batteries all the time it's an mfj 4230 mv super compact 30 amp mighty light switching yep. supply yeah this five-way binding posts yep it's a variable power supply from 4 to 16 volts uh, 20 can provide 25 amps continuous and 30 amps surge uh, power at 13.8 volts DC and it'll operate on 120 or 240 volts from 47 to 63 Hertz so it's a pretty versatile little power supply I've got basically that same power supply I love that thing it's nice light mm -hmm. it'll fit in that backpack really nice too you won't even know it's in there yeah for a supply that can put out that much current and you don't need that much current you don't need 30 amps for oh, an no. IC705, you could you could run your HF rig, um, your base station with this as well. So yeah, I do. Really nice little lightweight supply from MFJ. It's got a fan belt in it as well, but you don't ever hear that unless you're really loading it down, and and mm -hmm. then it turns on to cool it. As well, you'll probably want an antenna. And I've got one right here. This is Tommy's antenna. Uh, it is. If you hear me on HF and I'm from home, that's what I'm talking on. I've had that same antenna up in the tree for, it's, it's got to be probably five years now. And, and it, it's, it's hanging up there. It's, it hasn't failed me yet. It's and been a good antenna. I had taken that antenna out on field day at least two or three years mm -hmm. uh, in a row before uh, you put it in your tree. It, yeah. uh, it's a power light antenna, covers 40, 20, 10, and 6 meters. This one handles legal limit 1,500 watts, PEP, CW, or sideband. Now, you're not likely to get that out of a QRP rig, <laughs> but if you did, this is going to handle it right here. It's uh, the high-power version of the MFJ 2010. This one uses 14-gauge stranded uh, copper clad wire it's got porcelain end insulator so none of that plastic mm -hmm. stuff it's pull tested to 200 pounds a mfj has engineered a special bottom to go in here as well it's the uh, matchmaker feed block t 
test over uh, 98 percent efficient so all your power gets radiated it's height compensated so it doesn't have to be super high up in the trees or on the poles to to have a low swr on all the bands and it's built to last uv resistant marine abs feed block stainless steel hardware teflon so239 connector on here so it's ready to go out in the environments and a little coax. We're also uh, going to give away uh, a hank. I think you call that a hank, don't you? Of MFJ <laughs> RG8X coax with the connectors already on it. Cool. So somebody's going to win a really nice, pretty, pretty complete station. Yeah, very complete station. If you'd like to be the one to win that, well, we got a few rules here. Because what would a contest be without rules? It would be a free-for-all. So we want somebody to really, <laughs> you know, win this legit and have a great prize. So let's go over um, some of the rules here. Uh, first, you must be a licensed U.S. or Canadian amateur radio operator with a U.S. or Canadian shipping address. Only one entry per contestant. Sending more than one entry would disqualify the applicant. So please only send the one. Yeah. The winner is going to be responsible for any taxes that may be incurred. The winner agrees to use of his or her call sign and name and any promotional and news items related to the contest. And contestants must not be an employee or affiliate of Amateur Logic, Ham College, ICOM, or MFJ Enterprises. And how do you win? Well, it's, it's pretty easy. You send an email to contest2021 at amateurlogic.tv with only your call sign, only your call sign in the subject. Include your name, call sign, class of license, and address in the email message. Submissions must be made between Friday, August 13th, and Monday, October the 11th of 2021. If you haven't got your entry in, you've still got some time, but you need to go on and get it in soon so you can be uh, registered for the drawing. On the October 15th episode of AmateurLogic.tv, we're going to do a, a random number drawing of the entries that we've received, and we'll do it right before the show on October 15th. That's a Friday night, and we're going to announce it in that episode. So you want to tune in and be listening in a couple of weeks live Find out if you won. And if it's determined that the winning entry doesn't meet the qualifications, then we're going to do another random number drawing and select a winner by the same method. You can get all the rules and regulations. I don't and where do they go to get information? www.amateurlogic.tv forward slash contest. Yep. Go to this website right here, and you'll get all the details that you need. If you registered and you didn't get... Uh, confirmation email and you're and you're questioning it don't send an extra one and get disqualified email george or myself and we'll be glad to look and confirm that your entry is in there do go enter amateurlogic.tv slash contest we're going to be choosing someone and might as well be you me no no not you <laughs> me yeah but it won't be me all right, a uh, couple other things on the way out the door here we want to mention, and that's the Amateur Logic Sound Check Net that's going on every Tuesday night. Tell us a little bit about that, Tommy. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I, we've said this every time, and uh, we get new check-ins every week. It it's, uh, happens every Tuesday night, as you can see, at uh, 100, 0100 UTC, or 8 p.m. Central Time, so you can figure that out. It's on pretty much all the digital modes. We've uh, got three set, three linked hubs now that we're using. Uh, K8JTKs, uh, N8PCs, and K0JSC, the fun machine, uh, are all linked up with all their nodes and everything, uh, nodes and modes. Um, we have a question, uh, ham related, usually a ham-related question each time. And it's usually kind of fun question and... Uh, People kind of enjoy, uh, you know, answering the question, sharing a little bit about it. Um, you know, sometimes it's uh, 
something about some Radio Shack something or an antenna or what your favorite modes are, different things like that. Um, but anyway, it's it's really a good time. It's been going on for, uh, what was that? The last one was like the 76th yeah. one. So it's been going for 76 weeks now, and uh, it's still growing. So if you haven't uh, checked in on it, come check it out, and uh, I think you'll like it. Yeah. it. It really is a lot of fun. And let's see couple other things we wanted to mention here and that's during the month um, you know we do one episode of Amateur Logic every month around the 15th then an episode of Ham College around the end of each month or the first of each month and that leaves a generally a couple of weeks in between there that uh, we don't have a live show or you know a regular full-length episode We've been posting some Amateur Logic short videos there. Uh, the most recent couple that we've posted were um, of me. It was a W5JDX Classic, one I did oh, uh, a number of years ago on the MFJ Crystal Radio Kit. And in one of the shorts, I built it. The next one, I tested it and showed a couple of hacks there on it that uh, you could do to experiment a little bit. And so go check those out. Those are only on the Amateur Logic YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and uh, check out the Amateur Logic channel there, and you'll find them all. We we are working on those all the time and just port, posting those little short videos in there. So you'll have something in the off weeks to keep you entertained as well. Uh, if yeah. you... Yeah, you're definitely going to have to subscribe to get notified to those, though, because they don't uh, they don't go out on our normal feeds. Of course, you, you can watch them on the Roku and the YouTube app, but uh, if you subscribe, if you've got the Amateur Logic app and that's how you're used to watching us, um, you won't see those on there. So you need to subscribe on YouTube to be able to see the shorts. Yeah, and if you'd like to catch up and see what's going on throughout the month with us and the community of viewers. Well, we've got social media out there, facebook.com slash groups slash ham college or slash amateur logic. Yeah, we're also on Twitter at ham college and at amateur logic. Yep. And I can't read that one, Tommy. What's the next Me, one? we. We're on me, we. Um, so we not too long ago set up an account on there or a couple accounts so uh, mewe.com forward slash join forward slash ham college or and Amateur we're logic. also on groups io uh, that's groups.io slash g slash amateur logic mm -hmm. groups io is kind of cool if you're not really into the social media thing and you just want to get an email uh when we post something uh reminders uh reminder about the net or whatever contest stuff Whatever. Um, anyway, that's pretty nice because you can subscribe and just get one email a day if you want, or you can get emailed every time. So or, it's a nice alternative for people that don't do the social media stuff. Yeah, or reminders of when we're going to go live and uh, yep. you know when new episodes have been posted. And show notes as well. You can get those. Yep, amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki. So you can find out if you were interested in a certain topic that may have been in one of the shows, go to the wiki at that address and you can search for it. Um, you know, if we get an email from you that says, uh, hey, Tommy, which uh, segment was that where you built the uh, voltage monitor out of the Arduino? Uh, first place I'm going to go is go look in the wiki as well. So I think that did it for tonight. We got through it pretty well. There was only one buzzer tonight. Uh, there were a lot of trick answers in those questions tonight. Yeah. Your turn for the buzzer next month, though. Okay. All so, right. We'll just remember. I'll I'll try to remember. I might forget now. We'll just have to wait and see. Because <laughs> I, okay. I don't know what's in the next uh, group of questions there. But we'll find out. But we do want to, you to join us in two weeks on Friday night, the 15th. Find out who's going to win this prize package right here. It's a, it's going to be a yeah. fun event. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing who wins. Yep. And we'll have the twins, Emil and Mike, will be here with us as well. <laughs> the twins. 
Yeah. Yeah. Any final words yeah. before we go tonight? Any anything the class well, needs it wouldn't to know? Be just before the contest time, if I didn't say seventy three, good luck in the contest. So kind of pretty much have to do that. Okay. Yeah. But, I think that's a, a good statement there. We can all live by. <laughs> Well, thanks for being here. We appreciate you all watching. And, you know, join us again at the end of uh, October. And join us on the 15th for the next Amateur Logic. 7-3, and as Tommy said, good luck in the contest. 7-3, we'll see you next time. Working on a couple projects around the house here for some amateur logic segments and listen to the radio.